Okay, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce our today's guest speaker from TU Vienna, uh, Professor Eduard Greller. Um, Professor Eduard Greller did his PhD in Vienna and started his own visualization group there, um, which he runs very successfully. He's also, besides his professorship in Vienna, he's also appointed as adjunct professor at University of Bergen and as a key researcher at the Wierwiss Research Center in Vienna. His main fields of research are volume visualization, flow visualization, uh, but also information visualization. And today he's going to talk about variability in visualization. Okay, Edi, the floor is yours. I will hand the mic to you. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the nice introduction. Thanks for the invitation to be here. I think uh, a lot of interesting activities in computer graphics and uh, visualization are going on in, uh, uh, in Linz in, in recent years. So I think this is a very uh, exciting place what uh, research things are going on in, in graphics and visualization. Today I would like to talk about variability in visualization. I think this is an area which uh, became interesting in, in recent years. And with variability, I mean that uh, it is now possible that uh, you can uh, change your parameters, you can change your setup, you can calculate not just one situation, not one specific model, but you can have uh, ensembles, that you can have variations. And that's what I would like to talk about. So visualization is basically the use of computer-supported interactive visual representations, maybe of abstract data to amplify cognition. So in that sense, it is about uh, uh, computer graphics, visual representations are involved, but the goal is not to have, uh, let's say, a, a photorealistic representation of a scene or of an object, but you have a lot of data you would like to understand this data, uh, and uh, that's the goal of your representations. And traditionally, there have been several subfields in visualization, like uh, uh, flow visualization, volume visualization, information visualization. That's basically concerned what type of data are you looking at. With uh, volumetric data, you have uh, a three-dimensional domain, and uh, and uh, at each position, you have a have a scalar value. For example, a typical example would be. Uh, a medical domain, computer tomography, flow visualization means you have flow data, wind, uh, some other uh, flow that are, that are going around objects in, in the scene. Information visualization is uh, handling abstract data, the content of a database, for example, the content of your hard disk, and uh, here you have a, a scatter plot representation, part of it is selected, and you can do an analysis by finding out where are clusters, where are outliers, can you see trends in your data, and so on. Uh, recently, there has been another area which is called visual analytics, and visual analytics means that you are uh, t taking, you, you are interested in a visual analysis of your, of your data, but you are using uh, interfaces, visual interfaces, to do that. So on the one hand, you have a database, on the other hand, you have your visual uh, techniques to, uh, to process that. And uh, uh, data is increasing in compl complexity and variability for whatever, uh, for various reasons. I will shortly talk about that. And uh, the question is, how can you cope with this increased complexity and variability? The, the, the challenges are that there are new imaging modalities and data sources. So uh, that's uh, one thing that is driving our area. Uh, in, uh, in, in the past and, and uh, in the foreseeable future. Sometimes you have scanning technology where uh, you are you're measuring your, your object in slices and then you have a slice resolution of uh, let's say 512 times 512 pixel. But in electron microscopy, for example, you are generating slices where you have a res resolution of uh, 10,000 times 10,000 pixels. So in that sense, you have a much larger uh, data sources or sonar data. I mean, there are sonar devices where you can go with a ship on the ocean, you measure fish schools, for example, and then you are generating a cone-like data uh, chunk uh, at 
for twice every second and you are generating gigabytes of data uh, that, that you have to store and process. So there are very large data sets across several scales, for example. Sometimes uh, you would like to investigate a phenomena on very many different scales. You look at the person on the scale of uh, skeleton, muscle, uh, such features. Then you go down to in, in individual muscle fibers, for example, go down to chemical uh, substances, uh, and so on. So there are many scales in both, and between these scales, you have to think about how do these models that are overlapping, uh, do they contradict? Can they, can they be interpolated? What are you doing there? And then there are high dimensional, multi valued, multimodal uh, data. Multimodal means that uh, um, maybe you have a um, anatomical data, uh, CT, com computer tomography data, and at the same time you have functional data. So that would be two data sources concerning the same phenomenon. But nowadays it's, more, it's, it's possible that you have hundreds of data sets concerning the same phenomenon. How can you visually represent those? Or well, time varying data. Uh, nowadays it's possible that you take the heartbeat of a person and you have a, a medical CT and the medical CT can scan and capture the entire heartbeat uh, at once. So this means that you don't have only one data set for one time step, but you have uh, hundreds of time steps, so you, maybe even more. And uh, uh, recently, what also uh, became focus are uncertainties. I mean, the, in the entire process of measuring the data, of processing the data, there are some errors involved, some uncertainties. How are you coping with uh, uh, this additional informa information? Then there are possibilities of variations and ensembles. Ensembles means uh, you, you are measuring an entire population and you're comparing uh, the data that you, that you got there. Longitudinal studies means that you are uh, observing a population and over time you are watching how does certain uh, features develop. Like uh, how does the brain develop of a person, of, of a, well, a group of people when they are aging. I mean so the brain gets smaller and, and other things are happening there. So then you have suddenly a lot of, of data that you want to investigate. When we're looking at visualization, uh, <clears throat> for our visualization technique, there are two components that, that are really important. The one thing is what type of data you have. I mean, that led even to these different sub-disciplines like uh, volume visualization, flow visualization. So data is really the key. And then you need an analysis goal. What would you like to see? Do you have an hypothesis that you would like to verify in your data? Uh, so uh, you you take your visual you need to have the data you need to have your visualization goal and from these two components you end up with a specific visualization technique and as these data sources are getting more complex in a way this means also that we need different types of visualization techniques and uh, so how can we cope with this increased data variability and uh, first I would now give will give two examples. Uh, and uh, and then uh, later on I will show some directions where visualization could develop in the in the future. The first is uh, uh, visual steering uh, in a decision making scenario, and this is about uh, f a flooding scenario. Um, and uh, uh, the <clears throat> idea was, or I mean, there was this. Uh, um, hurricane in New Orleans 2005 that uh, led to a widespread flooding of uh, of New Orleans and the, the problem was that uh, some levees there was a breach in some of these levees so the uh, water larger ones and uh, they they tried to 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 close these breaches, but it didn't it didn't work. Some of the sandbags were then um, uh, flushed away, and so uh, in in certain situations this didn't work. This led to research projects later on. So there were hydrology institutes that really uh, did a, a construct a model of this flooding scenario. The houses are simple boxes here, for example, and they had then a small scale. Uh, canal and they tried to identify how can I, uh, where shall I place my, my barriers to uh, protect uh, several buildings, um, maybe some buildings are more important than other ones and so on. Uh, <clears throat> the next step would be that you take uh, everything into the computer, that's nowadays that you 
photography, you can have computational archaeology, everything nowadays you can have computational if you have models that you can simulate in the computer. So in this case, you have a, a simple uh, configuration of your scene. Uh, you you have here this uh, this uh, the canal, this uh, this flow. The flow is simulated in a simple way. This is called uh, s smooth particle hydrodynamics. This is a, a simple technique to solve uh, differential equations, Navier-Stokes equations. With that, you can simulate this flow. Flow consists of small particles that are moving according to the, the flow parameter, viscosity, and so on. And here, this is not a very exact uh, simulation, but in this case, it's more important to get a, a result early instead of uh, an exact one. And here we see then uh, a sort of simple visualizations that tell people that this building uh, might be flooded during the entire scenario, or might be endangered, or in green might be safe. So. Uh, this is a, uh, if, if you think of the simulation, there are a lot of uncertainties involved. You have uh, ver very many vari variations that you have to take into account. When will the breach happen? Where will the breach happen? How high will be the flood level, uh, flood velocity, and so on. So uh, in, in your decision making, you have a lot of what if questions you would like to, to, to have answered, which means the, that you are, have a lot of simulations. Nowadays, you can do uh, many of these simulations uh, because also on GPU, you have the processing power that allows you to do that. And then you, uh, you have all these simulation results which generate sort of parallel worlds. Each of these worlds describe an, an sort of an outcome of, uh, of, of your scenario. And, and they, they differ by uh, some parameter changes, some changes where the breach happens and so on. Um, <coughs> If you, if you have done that and you have all these parallel worlds, how can you find the best one or how can you switch between alternatives to get the best outcome? And so in this uh, uh, world lines uh, uh, approach, uh, here we have the simulations, here we have the user that is controlling that, and then there's a visual representation of uh, these alternatives. And on the, on the horizontal axis, there's the time, which tells you uh, uh, time is progressing. And one of these uh, uh, boxes or lines is one alternative. And when you have here a branching off, then you get an alternative uh, world. And, uh, and, and so you can, at, at one uh, glance, you can look at very many variations here. So, uh, and, and with this uh, overview of very many alternatives that you want to investigate, uh, you, you can control various views, several views, which are, this is a typical way in visualization that you have multiple linked views, for example, uh, and you can interact with these world lines. So, um, I think um, I've here a video that, that shows the, the principle of, of this world line approach. Um, <clears throat> so here is the, the, uh, this world line view where you have the various tracks. In blue you see the current track, then you have a 3D view that tells you what's going on in the, in the scenery. You have a 2D view where you can have interactions. You can place sandbags here, for example, and, and, and this is a simple 2D setup. Then each of these uh, lines uh, is a track, and uh, this represents one simulation run. And uh, uh, then, then you have one time step, one frame. This is one, one point in time. And each track consists of a sequence of these time steps. And then you have an active frame. The active frame tells you uh, with this cursor uh, where you are in time. You can have uh, uh, these branchings. Here some, something is happening. A sandbag are dropped. The velocity changes uh, and so on. And you can you can select uh, these uh, individual tracks. This will be one alternative. And in blue, you see the, the current one. Uh, and uh, all these views are, are synchronized and linked. And if you would, would move your timeline, you immediately see what's going on. And whenever there is an event happening, you see also in this monitor that sandbags are dropped or sandbags are flushed away. Uh, you, uh, you, you, you're taking a decision. So the, these are these interface elements like you see in a VCI as well. Uh, and uh, it's always followed the, the active world line. And you can navigate through these variations. 
So you can select a, a, a different uh, alternative and you immediately see how these alternatives uh, differ from each other. You can go back in time and uh, um, uh, jump from uh, from one event to the next, for example. So you have all kinds of uh, interaction mechanism uh, that that are available here. Um, uh, then there's a possibility uh, you would try a new alternative. The new alternative is what happens uh, if I increase the, the flow velocity at this point in time? Does this barrier hold or will, will it be flushed away? So you generate here a new track uh, branching off. A new variant is tested. And um, uh, here you can specify the flow velocity. You have these interface elements that you can arrange uh, in, in, in in, in, in this field, all this track can also be reordered, but now we are increasing the, the river velocity uh, and uh, start the simulation again and see what's, what's going on. And after some time, uh, it turns out that uh, this is uh, uh, rather unstable and the barrier is flushed away. So it might, it might be uh, more helpful that you position some, some barriers somewhere else before in the, in the, in the flooding and so to decrease the flow velocity, for example. Okay, so um, you can rearrange some of these elements, but I think uh, that's, that's enough for the moment to give you a, a feeling of how this uh, uh, system works. Um, and uh, uh, so this is a possibility. You have very many uh, events that are happening at an um, um, uncertain point in time, uncertain point in space. So it's also possible to calculate with uh, distributions here. So if you're not very sure about when exactly uh, the, an event happens, you can have a temporal uh, distribution according to uh, a probability density function. This is an example of uh, that you can also include a, a more realistic uh, um, model of the scenery. In this case, it's uh, it's Innsbruck, and you can have this simulation as well. There's also a possibility to 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 sketch your your elements. Maybe you are not sure where you would like to position your barriers. You have a sketch interface, and with this sketching, you can position uh, these elements. So. Uh, but uh, I'm not going into the, into much detail in that. There's a, a web page in, uh, where you can see some uh, some videos and some some further information on on, on this system. Um, another work uh, that I'm just very shortly um, um, uh, mentioning here is uh, something about parameter space analysis. So uh, if you have this model in your computer, maybe your uh, um, differential equations, you have these parameters, and, and, and these parameters uh, define a parameter space. And the question is always which parameter to select. In many cases, in, if you read the scientific paper, the authors are giving a parameter value and say, take this one, and are not explaining, is this a stable one? How did they come up with this setting? So this is... Uh, um, not very clear. And in this case, uh, uh, the, the, the idea was that you do sort of a sensitivity analysis in a local uh, way around uh, um, parameters. How does uh, uh, changes uh, in, in one parameter setting influence the outcome? And here in the, these colored bands, like this orange band uh, represents one variable. Uh, this is a simulation of car engine the fuel processes, and uh, uh, depending on some parameters, orange might be the loudness. So you would like to have an efficient uh, engine. It shall be fuel efficient, but not very, very loud. And this means that uh, if you have a, a, a very wide orange band, this means you can change your input parameter quite a while until you get a 5% change in the result. So. Uh, this, this is about 5% five, 5 change. Another uh, variable, which might be the fuel efficiency, is this, uh, uh, let's say, this magenta band. And here, uh, only a small change already leads to a 5% uh, uh, change in the, in the result. So from the, from the width of these bands, you recognize how sensitive the parameters are. And so uh, this work has been basically about this uh, um, sensitivity um, in, in parameter space. Basically, uh, what this leads to is, uh, uh, again, here in, in, in these two examples, we had a lot of different uh, 
uh, variants. A lot of models that we have to show at the same time. This, uh, this leads to um, uh, um, many data sets that somehow you have to combine. And this is uh, about uh, uh, how can you visualize multivariate scientific data. If you have so many different data sets for each time step, you can do uh, in a traditional way uh, fuse the data, put the data together, get one data set. On the, on the vertical axis here we have sort of this visualization pi pipeline. You acquire the data, you do some post-processing, then you do filtering, then you render, and finally you get an image or a video down here. And there are very uh, and, and, and along this visualization pipeline, you can do this combination of the of the data that is available at any of these stages. Yeah, this would be data fusion, or you do um, everything. Uh, you process each of your data sources separately, and at the end, you do an image fusion. That's an uh, alternative way. But basically, you can do. Uh, uh, in, in between, there are all these possibilities where you sort of can combine the information that you have. You can do a focus in context visualization, emphasize uh, important uh, information, and, uh, and still show an overview, for example. Or that you are uh, extracting uh, useful quantities, features, uh, maybe do some segmentation. And, and then for each of these useful quantities, you do a, a visual mapping like uh, taking a geometry, an isosurface, for example, or taking a, a glyph, uh, a geometric object that represents the data, or, do, or, or take a special algorithm, direct volume rendering, volume data, for example. And then you get a combined visualization. And so uh, this is about multivariate scientific data, but what can we do in our situation? I mean, how can we cope with this complexity and variability? Um, when you have data complexity, there are well-known strategies how you can um, uh, handle those. I mean, you can do subsetting. Subsetting, you just take a small set of, of the data that you have. Or you can do slicing. Slicing means you are just taking uh, uh, also a subset, but maybe this data is lying on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a plane, for example. In medical imaging, when you have a, a computer tomography data set, it's a 3D data set, you are cutting this data set along through a bone, for example, or vessel. Projection is, uh, is another technique. I mean, uh, basically, you are throwing away one or, or several dimensions. Uh, maximum intensity projection is well known in, in, in medical visualization. Uh, it's uh, for each pixel of your image, you are following a ray through the data, and you're just taking the maximum, a very simple one. Or dimension reduction. In, in data mining, this is uh, very well known. You have a data set with 10. 50, 100 dimensions, what are the most important ones? Maybe not all dimensions have this, uh, the, the, the same importance. You can do uh, um, principal component analysis, uh, multidimensional scaling, whatever. Or clustering. Clustering means um, you're taking your objects. Some of them are maybe similar according to a certain metric, according to a certain quantity, and you're combining those to one a larger element, uh, a cluster. This allows you to find outliers, uh, trends, and so on. But how can we reduce the, the visual complexity? So this is about data complexity. It has been well, uh, well researched. Researched. A lot of things are going on here. But when we are thinking about visual complexity, I will now shortly give three uh, examples that might be uh, interesting and might be sort of. Uh, um, uh, ideas in which direction um, uh, research work in this area can go on. The first one is integrated views. I mean, it's uh, it, uh, by itself, it's it's not so important in the sense of that this is the most or uh, the best way how to to integrate these data sets. But it's just a way how we can combine uh, very different data sources. And in this case, we have volumetric data. Uh, that describes a body or a, a part of a body. And on the other hand, we have abstract data uh, that is, describes how these anatomical um, structures belong together, how they are classified, and how can we combine those. And this is about having views on the data, linked views and integrated views. I mean, uh, if, if, uh, if the data is too complex, then um, the views also become too complex if you don't uh, focus on, on, on a small part of the data, so you could have separate views side by side. So this removes the overload 
In one view, you see the anatomical situation. In the other one, you see the the graph or the abstract data, but you lose the context. I mean, uh, if you look at this uh, node of the tree, where does it refer to? Does it is, is it related to an uh, to an anatomical structure or not? So the next thing would be these linked views. Uh, this means linked views. Whenever you are interacting with one view, uh, you see the same interaction or the same operation or the the um, corresponding operation in the other view. So if um, if I'm interacting with the head and, and, and this node corresponds to, to the head, selecting this head will also uh, um, highlight this, this node here, for example. So uh, in that sense, the context is re-established. I'm interacting with one window and immediately see what's going on in the other windows as well. But the scalability, how does this scale? Uh, how many linked views can you have on the screen? Uh, with a medical workstation, usually people have four, but that's uh, can you, can you have 10, 20? So here you have an issue with uh, scalability. Uh, integrated views means that you are reusing the same space. So you are taking the same space and show all the information. Uh, is possible only for uh, certain types of data, uh, but might be uh, a possibility to, to combine um, heterogeneous information. And uh, I'm just giving here now this, this one example. So in this example, we, we have this uh, abstract data. Uh, it's, a, it's a tree uh, of the anatomical structures. And here on the left side, we have an anatomical information by itself. So you can have this side side representation. You can just concentrate on the uh, volumetric data by, by having um, uh, volume rendering, for example. Or you're just uh, concentrating on the abstract data. Uh, there are very many graph drawing layouts that uh, describe how you can arrange um, such a, uh, a graph or a tree. Uh, a very often used technique is the node link diagram, which means uh, the, the vertices in your graph are the, are, are the nodes and then the edges are sort of links between these nodes. And in this case, what we have done uh, is we took the node, increased the node, and then we can represent uh, here in, uh, in, in each of these uh, nodes, we can have uh, a, a volumetric data set. And uh, when, we are, when, when you are na navigating uh, in, in, in these nodes, then you can uh, um, uh, take also the abstract data to uh, guide your, your interaction, for example. So I think we have a short video here. Um, and so, um, what we were investigating here is how can you uh, uh, interact or switch between these two spaces, the volumetric space and the abstract space given as a, a, as a tree here. And so, if you do slicing, you can uh, color also the nodes in a way that uh, whatever uh, is described by the slicing plane uh, refers to the coloring of the of the child nodes. Or you can have here a representation of the child nodes, again slicing. Here you see where the slicing happens. Uh, and uh, you, um, well, the next one is uh, if you do a selection and uh, um, <coughs> you would like to see uh, where a certain structure is up in the tree, uh, that can also have an influence on the, on the visibility, for example. In this case, uh, um, uh, we see we are interacting with this structure, but this structure is highlighted uh, uh, in, 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 in the tree above as well. Okay, um, so th this is, um, I'm not going sh to show the, the entire. Uh, video because basically what we were uh, exploring here is uh, you can have a visualization, abstract one, an integrated one, a spatial one, and you can also have an uh, interaction, uh, integrated or an abstract one, and uh, uh, we were exploring what different uh, ways of combinations are possible. This is the one thing. And what is also very interesting is, in which space are you doing the integration? In this case, we took the abstract space, the, the graph uh, layout, the tree drawing, and there we augmented that and put the uh, anatomical information there. We could do it the other way around as well. We could take the uh, 3D space where the, the 
an atomic structure is living and include the, the graph information there. So this is one example of integrated use. The next one is a, a comparative visualization. Comparative visualization means if you have so many different data sets, how can you, can you compare those to each other? Uh, and the background of uh, this work is um, uh, industrial CT. Industrial CT uh, works uh, more or less like uh, uh, medical computer tomography. But there, in, in, in industrial CT, you are exploring, for example, engine block. You want to do non-destructive testing. You have a, an engine block uh, of metal, of aluminum, and you would like to find out, are there any defects, are there any pores? And uh, uh, without uh, having to cut it open, you put it into an industrial CT, and you get uh, a scan of, uh, of, of this object. Um, these industrial CTs, um, from the development um, stage, newer than medical cities, so they, are, they don't have uh, these established parameter settings that you have for medical cities. Uh, for medical city, if you want to have a scan of a certain organ, uh, people have an experience how they have to set the parameters. With the uh, uh, industrial city, that's not uh, uh, quite the case. It depends also what is the material. Do you have metal, uh, steel, aluminum, plastic, uh, and so on. And uh, the parameters can be the voltage. It's a, um, um, uh, you, the, the scanning means that you're taking individual x-ray images, uh, which is called the projection, and then you are rotating your object in, and, and you're generating 360 or 720 of these projections, and from that you are back projecting uh, the, the information and you get a 3D volume. How much current do you need, uh, integration time, sometimes they're using pre and post filter plates and so on. So there, there are uh, very many parameters and uh, this generates uh, several data sets. And depending on how you are putting your object into this uh, uh, scanning device, the result might be uh, better or worse. So if uh, even the orientation, so I mean if you put the an object like this in the industrial CT, it's much better to put it in this way and rotate it, uh, and the X-ray coming in this way, instead of, of having a situation where the uh, X-rays are having to go through the object for a long time. So the orientation plays uh, an important role. So how can I, then I suddenly have uh, a couple of data sets, 15, how can I compare those? Well, I mean, if you want to, to compare two data sets, you can take this checkerboard pattern, you overlay it onto your image in the in the black uh, uh, squares you show one data set in the white squares you show the second data set so this uh, this works for for two, two data sets and especially at the border region you see you can easily compare two data sets uh, when you would like to see more than one two data sets well you could uh, split up uh, a circle in various sectors and then in each of these sectors you are showing uh, a data set so that's basically, but a, a circle is not space filling. So what we took uh, were uh, hexagons, and these hexagons can be subdivided in sectors. Here we have a central area where we show uh, one data set where we would like to compare the others two. And uh, uh, then we can um, <coughs> subdivide our image in, into these hexagonal uh, regions uh, and uh, can compare adjacent data sets. So here in the center we see the fused data set and uh, we, we are showing four adjacent data sets uh, and in this case the, the voltage has been uh, changed. Um, here we see the data set themselves and if you would look closely, especially here in these uh, this areas down here in this object, you see the contrast variations. Also here, uh, this, this should be a, a drill hole uh, but because of the penetration length being here uh, longer than at, at, the, at the top, uh, you, you see these artifacts. Um, you can, here you do a direct density visualization. You take the data, display it in these various fields, and then you compare it. But you can also uh, have a relative density visualization in the sense of that you are showing the differences. And here we see the central data set, and uh, um, here, the deviation from this uh, central data set is color-coded 
Green means almost no deviation, red and blue means deviation. In this case, you see immediately that this upper right uh, data set with the 150 kV uh, is, uh, is deviating more from the center data set than the other one. Um, you can have then um, sort of a uh, <coughs> sort of a lens uh, and with this lens you can mo move over your, your data set and, uh, and, and, and show the, uh, in this case, four reference data sets with the deviation coloring. Um, here we go from the data set from, we do a slicing along the horizontal axis. You can change uh, uh, several of these uh, uh, parameters like uh, uh, do you want that this border stand out or not? Um, and uh, in, in the center we have now a data set where the number of projections is small which means you get these uh, um, streaking artifacts and that's uh, readily uh, visible in this case that uh, basically all the other data sets have, have a strong deviation to this central one. In this case red encodes the, uh, how homogeneous is it uh, the, um, the data set and that tells you also that you have certain outliers. Uh, <coughs> okay, so um, this uh, was one example of comparative visualization. I think there will be a lot of techniques in the in the future, not just, I mean, this is just slice-based. If you have then 3D structures, how are you comparing those? How are you showing a difference uh, in those? Um, there, I think we will see a lot of, of work in this area. The last example uh, is uh, called fuzzy visualization. I mean, uh, and, and, and this includes now this uncertainty and fuzziness in the display process itself. Um, I was talking about uncertainties. Uncertainties are described by, uh, by probability density functions. And uh, there's an entire theory, the fuzzy set theory, that is also sort of uh, incorporating this this fuzziness, and that can be included in the in the visualization process as well. Uh, and uh, the the idea was here that um, um, we would like to bring um, the the task or the the uh, the mechanism um, or, or that the user has to do into his domain, into his language. I mean. Ludwig Wittgenstein at one point was saying, the limits of my language mean the, ling uh, the limits of my world. So in the medical domain, if you ask a, a doctor to specify opacity or color, that's beyond what, what he or she understands. So they will not do that. But if, uh, if sort of uh, they are using their uh, um, language, their terms, uh, and, and sort of having these rules, then uh, th this is less abstract and that might, uh, might uh, be acceptable to them. So the idea would be that instead of having a transfer function, transfer function means you are specifying a color and opacity for each density value, we have these rules. Something like if principal curvature is not positive, then contours are bluish. So on the one hand, you have rules where the left side concerns the data and the right side concerns the, concerns the visual display. And uh, that we would like to combine uh, together. Uh, here below, we have this tra traditional transfer function. You take a, a density value, you have volume attributes. A density value, curvature, some other values. And then you are assigning a color and, um, and a, a, um, an opacity value. Uh, instead of that, uh, we are taking these volume attributes and of each of these attributes, we make a, um, a fuzzy set. So we are mod modeling these attributes through a fuzzy set. If you have an X-ray uh, X, uh, data set, 100 de density value corresponds maybe to bone. But 99 is also almost a bone, 105 as well. So uh, being a, being a bone, for example, can be easily modeled with such a fuzzy set. And then we have this rule base, and uh, uh, for, from this rule base, we are moving over to a style. I would like to show contours. I would like to show isosurfaces. Uh, and, 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 and these rules are driving then these uh, connections. So um, um, I'm, I think I will... I will skip this uh, and, and show you examples, just examples. I'm sorry about this. 
uh, basically uh, something like uh, you, you define these rules here uh, penetration depth concerns how long is array going through the data set and uh, uh, distance to focus means you, you define uh, somewhere a position that uh, you, you would uh, like to control your visual representation by the distance to this focus and then you, you have a visual style. Here you define a fuzzy set also your, your styles, your, your skin style, your contour style is also defined by a fuzzy set and this, uh, this rule is then uh, handled through fuzzy set theory. So you have to uh, model an implication, uh, you, you, you take your fuzzy sets, do an implication, aggregation, defuzzification. This is all what is done in usual fuzzy set theory. Uh, and what the, what, the, what the domain expert has to do, just play around with these, with these rules. And uh, uh, whereas the, the fuzzy sets for the volume attributes and for the, for the visual attributes have to be defined just once beforehand. Okay, so at the end, um, so th these were three examples how to co cope with this visual complexity, comparative visualization, um, then this fuzzy visualization, and um, what, was the, what was the first one, the integrated views. Uh, so at the end, I want to just keep some outline uh, what might be interesting research topics, maybe some of you would like to work on that. Um, in uh, probably you heard of co of the term computational photography. That means uh, you have a lot of images, photographs, and somehow you are computationally combining those, and you, then you get a new image, maybe a panoramic view, for example. Can there be a computational visualization? I mean, in this sense, uh, sometimes uh, visualization is uh, uh, you have a system you can control that, but sometimes you have very many different systems where you get the results out of that. So can we combine those? I talked about integrated views and the interaction. I gave this one example and also about comparative visualization. Also comparative navigation. I mean, how can you, if you have so many different spaces, uh, do a navigation that you don't lose overview and you are navigating through these various spaces? Difference visualization is a very important part of comparative visualization if you're interested in the small deviations. Um, but also contradictory visualization. Sometimes data is missing and that's already very difficult to handle. I mean, uh, are you forgetting about this data? Are you doing interpolation, reconstruction? But what happens if the data is contradicting itself? Like in archaeology, some people believe that they're building uh, looked in a certain way, other people believed it looked in a different way. How can you simultaneously show that? Or if you have two models that are describing the same phenomenon on different scales, uh, a model that is uh, describing the skeleton of the, of the um, human body and at some point you have chemical reactions and maybe somewhere in between where they overlap or where the one model is hardly valid anymore, you have an overlap there where you might get contradictions and it might be interesting to, uh, to, to visualize those. Information theory, I mean, uh, <clears throat> now that we have so many uh, possibilities, uh, we can do optimization. What is the optimal viewpoint of my data? So I can do optimization uh, and here um, information theory might come into play. Where do I get most of the information out of a uh, representation? Looking at the object from different angles might give me more or less information. So this uh, lead to fuzzy visualization. Sparsification means how can I reduce the visual representation to the absolute necessary. I'm just showing the contours, I'm just showing the silhouettes. Maybe for the context I'm showing just contours and the focus I'm showing in color. Um, parameter space analysis uh, is, is, is very important. Um, as I said, uh, uh, um, sometimes people are just giving one parameter and if, you have, if your data has a, a slightly different char characteristics then the algorithm doesn't work. Maybe you have to change to a different parameter. So that might be a, a local stabi uh, stability analysis or a global one. When does an algorithm break? I mean, how far can I go with my data characteristics? How much noise can I add until it breaks? So uh, analyzing these parameter spaces uh, can be very interesting. For also for automatic parameter tuning. Now that I can 
that I can calculate with my GPU so many variations of my of my system, I can select an, uh, an, an, a good parameter. Interaction sensitivity. Sometimes people are interacting with a slider and uh, a certain slider change hardly changes anything in the result image and in, in another situation, slightest changes in the slider lead to drastical changes. It would be interesting to think about uh, that whatever interaction you're doing, if you are moving your slider by one centimeter, you would like to get sort of, let's say, a 10% change in your result, wherever your slider is for the moment. Um, <clears throat> there's an area, there are certain areas where accuracy is really important, uh, like uh, uh, you, you would need to have upper and lower bounds. You have to be sure that your result is within these bounds. So there's interval arithmetics. You're not calculating with one value, but uh, with an interval. <coughs> and uh, sometimes uh, uh, you can go from an interval to a distribution. Some values within your interval are more likely. It's more likely that your uh, levy is, is, is breaching in a certain region than in an, another one. So you can take distributions and can can do a visualization not with one value but with intervals or or with uh, these distributions. This is this uncertainty visualization. There has been a tutorial at the VIS conference and, and the slides are available there. Uh, nowadays we are uh, in visualization people are very algorithmic centric but our domain experts they are very much data or image centric. They are not so much interested in our fancy algorithms, they have a problem with their data and they want a uh, uh, solution for that. So m maybe we go uh, a little bit away from this algorithmic centric way and come to, instead of an imperative approach, to declarative approaches. Imperative approach means you're giving uh, one statement after the other, to this, to this, to this. So this would be a sort of, I'm giving the algorithm. But maybe uh, you, you're specifying what, how shall your result look like. I would like to see the bone very well. I don't care if, if that's uh, direct volume rendering, I don't care if that's uh, surface rendering. So that you are sort of uh, declaring what you would like to have and internally the system is selecting the best algorithm, the best parameter settings. Um, years ago, I mean you will not remember that, there was a, uh, uh, and this is, uh, this topic is uh, frameless rendering, algorithmless rendering is in the same what I said before. Uh, frameless rendering, some people were coming up with a way of calculating an animation sequence and they were not calculating the animation sequence image by image, but they were over time just updating uh, that part of the image which uh, needed uh, the most attention, so that was, which was changing the most. So in the end, they, they calculated the entire animation sequence, but they didn't have uh, a, a, an image by image. At no point they had one image, because they, every pixel ha was valid for a certain uh, point in time and in the next time step they were updating just a few of those pixels. So algorithm-less rendering would then mean that for each part of your data you are selecting a different algorithm. So somebody is deciding, um, hopefully automatically, uh, at this region the data has a certain characteristic this deserves to have a specific algorithm. So you have several algorithms. How can you combine algorithms? Uh, th this is the same like what I said, this de declarative approach. Um, uh, program verification has been uh, around for, for quite some time. Uh, maybe you would like to have an image verification. You are specifying constraints that you would like to have fulfilled for your result and then the algorithms are, are generated uh, uh, or selected uh, by, by, by the system. What in, in, in publishing and visualization involves is <clears throat> that um, everybody's saying in research everything has to be reproducible. So uh, you do an experiment and somebody else should be able to repeat it. But in many cases in our field uh, it's not reproducible. You don't have the data available, you see the, the, this, uh, this paper of 10 pages, you see some images, they describe the data. But you don't have the data, you don't have the algorithm, uh, and, and sometimes the, not all the parameters are given, maybe you don't have the hardware or the hardware descriptions. So it's very difficult to reproduce that. And uh, I think with uh, uh, this increased complexity, it will be necessary so that uh, uh, we as a science have, uh, have an impact 
that we have to think about this stability and robustness uh, 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 in more detail. It will not be possible to say, I have this algorithm works on three data sets and that's fine. So you sort of have to provide uh, pl plausible information that it is uh, robust, stable. And uh, there are initiatives in other disciplines where they are encouraging people to submit more than the paper. So also the code, also the data, uh, so that it is uh, uh, repro reproducible easily and, and, uh, and, and other people can also, uh, whatever you generated in your paper, can, can do that again. I mean, there are certain uh, aspects to it. Sometimes the data is not freely available, there are confidentiality um, aspects and so on. So uh, that's basically what I wanted to, uh, to talk about. Uh, I wanted to, to finish with a, a statement of, of Voltaire. Doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is absurd. So in, in, in many cases we have in our, in, in, in our applications, we have this uncertainty and we have to cope with it. So thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for a very interesting talk, Eli. Um, come to questions. Are there any who wants to go first? Thank all the time. We need to start. Then people warm up. <laughs> okay, then I will start. So I have a couple of questions. The first one would be, let's come to your last comment, which was um, on reproducibility. There are other communities, like the medical community and also the biology community, who started to make this mandatory. You have to submit your data with your scientific publication. Do you think this will be also valid, not only for visualization, but also for computer science in general? Or do, should we do that? <coughs> Uh, in, in certain areas, in certain areas, it, it was apparently easier to come up with test data set. Like if you look in computer vision, there you have this test data set and everybody is exploring segment, new segmentation algorithm on these data sets. And I think it would be uh, necessary and there have to be some steps in this direction. Uh, <coughs> But, it, uh, th but there are a lot of challenges involved. I mean, as the data sources are, are changing so fast, I mean, uh, this will be sort of a problem. I mean, five years ago, you didn't have uh, electron microscopy or some of uh, the data that, that you are working. I mean, these databases are, are, are huge. Either you have then test, test suits that are artificially small and outdated very fast, uh, or, uh, or it, it will be difficult to collect those. So I think there, are, there should be um, uh, actions in this direction, but it is not easy. I mean, people are talking about this for, uh, for, for years, for 10, 15 years, and I have the feeling that it has gone easier how, how to cope with this. Also with the uh, algorithms, for example, sometimes they are tailored to a specific GPU um, architecture and, and in, in a year you have a different architecture. So um, uh, it is necessary uh, and I don't see um, uh, how it can be done easily, but it should. I think there could be a possibility that such action is rewarded, something mm -hmm. like if somebody manages to do that and is providing all the information in the review process, he gets some extra point, or is easily uh, is more easier accepted. Yeah. yeah. So it was, it was a long, a long answer, which tells you I don't know. Okay. Because there is also this interesting new development in. Uh, so I know it from from medicine. There you have the possibility then also to comment on scientific publications, and this is also published in this scientific journal, which is interesting new thing to happen. Uh, I mean, the publishing process will change in the in the near future drastically. I think we we cannot foresee. We are still in this. Uh, there's a publisher that is printing books or journals, and the the journals are sent out to to the readers. But this is nowadays we are rapidly moving on that the journals are only electronic only. Mm -hmm. And previously you had issues. I mean, you were collecting ten papers and then you were printing those and sending it out. Nowadays you still they are electronics, some of those, like TVCG, you still have these issues, but there's no sense in having issues anymore because you're not sending out those anyway. You could have any of these social media 
interaction possibilities. I mean, you could people can comment. I like this paper. I implemented this paper and had these difficulties. So you could have a, a live stream commenting on the on the paper. You could have the reviews of the paper there. I mean, involve certain uh, uh, certain um, constraints and considerations. But uh, basically, it's about the visibility. Um, nowadays, visibility means it is published or not. In the future, it will mean visibility, how many people are accessing uh, the paper. Uh, right now, uh, printing the paper is the, is the expensive stuff. Uh, in the future, it will be how much can the reader absorb. I mean, you, uh, when you have now electronic only, you could make the paper, why, why 10 pages? Why not 15, 20, 200 pages? So, but that's overloading the reader. Mm -hmm. But there will be a lot of interesting uh, issues in the, the publishing companies. Okay, let's come back to the content. Oliver. I have three questions on three different topics. The first is on the sandbag simulation um, example that you showed at the beginning. At which point does visualization help the user to figure out in this particular task where the sandbag should be placed? Ideally, compared to having an algorithm computing. Um, Why do you need the human in uh, uh, Basically, you have uh, way too many uh, possibilities. The parameter of the science space is simply too too large. So the idea would be, uh, for example, in the long run, it would be great for a disaster response that somebody is with a tablet going there and and, and, and taking decisions. But beforehand, it would be interesting for training of, the, of, of people that are involved with such situations. And then the design space is simply way too, too large. I mean, the, if you have a breach, where, where can this breach be? Uh, and, and the idea would be that you have an experienced disaster expert that is saying, oh, it's highly likely that here or there is something happening. And then he's then visually exploring the neighborhood of that. And there is also not. Uh, there's not an uh, a, a optimization function that is well defined. I mean, in, a, in a such a situation, you would like to save as many houses as possible. Maybe, uh, but I, I have to sacrifice these five buildings and can, can uh, um, save the, the hospital, for example, or the safe path away from the hospital is still dry when I still uh, give up on this one house. So there is not this, uh, this one uh, uh, global optimization function, and I think that the design space is, is too large. So, uh, I mean, uh, here, this is worked together with uh, hydrologists in, in, in Vienna, and um, there's also uh, a, a small sub-project going on with people in Cologne that are very interested in this, uh, practicing uh, beforehand what could go on, and there they, they, they like this visual representation. So, but you're right. I mean, if if there's one one global optimization function, then go for it. Then every more maybe the user designs that function by providing constraints or rules, maybe on a visual basis that apply in general, but can still apply something like a fuzzy solver in that case that tries to make at least a suggestion on the computational basis which are possible options. Yes, absolutely. Actually, there, for example, you can, you can specify a, a distribution. The distribution tells you where, the, uh, where you would like to place your barriers. You can sketch your barrier, but you are unsure, so you give a variance. And then the system automatically calculates some of these variations and tells you uh, this, this choice uh, will uh, reduce the global uh, uh, house damage to a certain degree. So the, this uh, this has to be included because uh, uh, there there are too many variations. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's it's uh, necessary to have the input of the of the user. And the question I had on the integrated views, uh, just a technical question. You mentioned that. You explained examples where you integrated um, or where, where you used the abstract representation like pre-visualization for the outer kind of visualization and for the inner kind of visualization you used the data geometry volume representation. And then you mentioned you can also do this the other way around. What would be the example? <coughs> you could have, for example, a head and you do an exploded view 
and, and then you show in this 3D space uh, uh, a relationship between uh, the head consists of the, of the skull and other structures so that you embed your, your abstract information as annotations, as labels, as, as arrows in, in the 3D space, for example. An explosion view with links or something. For example, yes. So, uh, but I, I think what, what is all already done for quite often are these labeling, this annotation. You are, you are highlighting, you are circling, you are adding some other thing that that has to then uh, include the the abstract information. So. And for the fuzzy visualization, the question is. In which way, practically, do the domain experts define the fuzzy rules? How does that work? Uh, well, I mean, the, um, uh, there's domain knowledge that tells you, for example, that in a uh, computer tomography scan, uh, there are different types of bone, but a very strong bone has, I don't know, maybe a density value of 500. And some, somebody that has experience with the scanning is then defi defining a fuzzy set that tells you that uh, 500 with a certain variance, this would be the fuzzy set that describes bone. So, some, uh, so this would be the domain expert, but not, uh, uh, not the one that is using the system on a daily basis. The, the person that is using the system on a daily basis is uh, then defining these rules. If, I, if, if this would be strong bone, I would like to see it in white, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, so the idea would be that uh, these fuzzy sets are defined once for the volume attributes, for the features. They, they, they have to, this has to be done only once, and then the, the users are just using then the rules. So. Okay, and, and the rules could then be like programmed or something like that in a rule-based system? Or There's a rule-based uh, rule system where uh, actually uh, the, the, the person that has done this has, has an interface where for each, you, you can select an uh, attribute. Attribute can be boniness, which means is this bone or vesselness, or closeness to vessel, this could be attributes. Um, and then you take this and you can define a rule if, uh, if I have this uh, uh, attribute or not this attribute or this attribute uh, in a certain range, then uh, you take this style. So he's, uh, uh, with a simple interface, he is uh, uh, um, interactively specifying the rules. So would, do you think it's also possible to do the other way around? Like coming up with the fuzzy sets from the way the users interact with the data when they visualize it? Uh, we had, uh, we had a, um, a work in this direction, but that's, uh, that, that's not actually not so easy uh, because somehow you have to show the data. When you, when you show the data, you already have certain visual parameters to specify, and then you could circle a region and saying, okay, I would like to see this one. So yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. But uh, I think it's a little bit more difficult the other way around. So that was a, a one work uh, where, you, where you look at the data, maybe at slices, you specify regions and say, okay, that's an attribute or that's what I'm interested in. And then you, you can specify that uh, also visually. I could also imagine when you're visualizing volume data and tweaking the density parameter for certain regions you want to filter out, that you could, for many different data sets and different type of views, and but always looking at the same object, to train a fuzzy solver with these parameters to find out what's the optimal fuzzy set or the optimal parameters for a particular object. To yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe also all the different users who might meet these parameters. To uh, that has uh, to. There have been some work in this direction where people were specifying by strokes. I'm uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a slice, uh, I, I draw a stroke. This is a structure I'm interested in. Uh, I'm making other strokes and structures I'm not interested in, and then training a neural network to find to sort of find a, a classifier for the data in a higher dimensional space. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's uh, interesting, yes. But you mentioned also at the, at the end that one interesting point is to have the algorithm decide which visualization technique is best for a particular 
pace. Would it be, do you think it would be possible to learn this by using data that is visualized from a large group of users, for example, or the different applications to have an automatic decision instead of a program rule that somebody has to specify at some point which visualization makes sense for which case, even if this is quite fuzzy? Uh, that would be well, very interesting, actually. The question is how you can end up with such a database. I mean, in, right now it's done on a rather rough classification that uh, people are saying for this type of task you should use rather these two algorithms and for some other tasks uh, something else. But I think that that might be uh, interesting in, in a way. Uh, I think if we have a visualization system that many users use, some sort of crowd um, visualization system that collects the data, how people use the visualization tool for particular data or for particular task and then come up with some sort of at least a recommender system that mm -hmm. makes recommendations on how to visualize particular data sets. Yeah. And the system is trained using the crowds. Yeah. Crowds uh -huh. um, <coughs> in many of our cases when we are doing scientific visualization and there the, the user base is not so large. I mean when when we have medical people, then a few of those are, are testing our system. Uh, I think that would be uh, would be very interesting. Uh, the, the thing is, um, you probably somehow have to restrict your design space because otherwise people will use too many different algorithms that are totally different. Where you might get a classification, use this algorithm or that algorithm, but not in a way how you can uh, integrate algorithm. I think. I think you can, there are uh, possibilities that you take two algorithms and they are combined that, that, that you're using them at the same time. Not even uh, for this pixel I'm using this uh, algorithm one and for the next algorithm two, but that I'm using algorithm one and a little bit of algorithm two uh, in, uh, for, for one pixel. I mean, we had a, uh, Stefan Bruckner had a, a technique about uh, combining MIP and direct volume rendering uh, in the same time, and, and that was sort of uh, interpolating between the algorithms. But that was uh, the, the, the the optimization function was was uh, given. Like we, we don't want to specify parameters, and uh, it, you should get expressive results. But I think uh, what you said might have, could be quite interesting. Yes. If you learn from the users, if you have a particular problem. That is solved by that's done by 100 users and 40 or 50 users use a similar combination of visualization techniques to get whatever they need to get out of the data. And maybe this is something useful you can learn and suggest to other users, not mm -hmm. by specifying mm -hmm. like, this, like a programmer who does not just what the best combination. There's a, there, there, there's a area which is called knowledge assisted visualization, which tries to, to add some more information, not only the data, and the one would be the history or the, 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 the use, how, the, how did the user interact with the data. When you open your medical data set and every user is always doing a 45 degree rotation, you can learn that and then you do the rotation automatically. Or uh, specifying the parameters, automatic. what would be the a good viewing angle or a zoom factor, uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> you would need to to uh, store the, the the use behavior and, and from that to, uh, define patterns. I think in the HCI community there were there are certain uh, works in this direction, but in, in visualization not not too much. And I think that would be interesting. And I even think you could maybe think about blending different visualization techniques together. If you know 60% of the users did this kind of visualization for that problem, 40 this, you don't have to go only for the 60 case, but you might be able to blend things together because you I mean, decide that these two visualization techniques are kind of good, the one is 60% good, the other one is 40% good, and maybe this gives you also a little bit of how to blend uh -huh. the visualization. Also about the interaction, you could have a guided navigation. Uh, um, most of the users were first taking a look here, and then uh, afterwards they, they did, did certain operations. So you could have interaction patterns that you are uh, proposing, for example. Yeah, I think this. Uh, and um, um, 
I think somehow it will, it will be necessary uh, because if, if you have so many data sources, especially in visual analytics, where you have this abstract data, some you have 10 data sources and, and the next five data sources are sometimes available, sometimes not, and you would like to get an overview of your data, then some, somebody has to automatically arrange the information for you. Maybe sometimes one data source is becoming invalid or uh, the reliability is going down. And, uh, and I, I don't think that, uh, that, that the user is deciding which algorithm to use where, how do I lay the layout. There must be some, uh, some mechanism that it, this is done uh, automatically. So I think this, this has to be done, otherwise you cannot cope with this, uh, with this complexity. Okay, one last quick question. Anyone? Okay, then I will take one of my list, the last one. So you talked about uncertainties and how you can combine them and what they can occur along this pipeline. And you talked about particular about data uncertainty. But there's also uncertainty involved that comes in the image. Like if you have the rendered image, there's maybe some overplotting which introduces uncertainty, or then maybe some um, some uncertainty from percep perspec uh, perception, so people who look at the visualization may judge the depth differently. So, um, do you think this need to be uh, considered, or <clears throat> oh, is yes. there a way to consider this? <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. I mean, uh, <clears throat> well, we had this we had this tutorial at the VIS conference this year on, um, on parameter space analysis and uncertainty, and. Uh, 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 Hans Christian Hege has, uh, I think his slides are very interesting on, on this topic. Mm -hmm. So, um, uncertainty is happening at, at various places. You are absolutely right. Uh, it's also on the perception, and it's on the perception, and also what ends up in the brain. How is that interpreted? Um, um, sometimes, you know, uncertainty, people don't like uncertainty. If you go to the medical doctor, you don't want to have. A uh, fuzzy statement. You might have something, uh, and so so in, in this case, medical doctors are really giving you a strong statement, although they know <laughs> sometimes that they are quite uncertain. But they want to give you this sense of uh, that's it. So in in, in some cases, uh, people don't want this uncertainty. This is just distracting. I mean, in a in a disaster response decision, if you are overloaded with so much information anyway, you have to do something very fast, maybe you don't care for small uh, uncertainties. In other areas, it's, it's vital. I mean, in, uh, in some technical disciplines like uh, dimensional metrology, people have these variances, these tolerances, and they have to be kept. I mean, you have to produce uh, this work piece, and it has to be within these tolerances, there's no way. With visualization, how you include that in, the, in, in the visually, this is not this is not solved. I mean, and, and as I said, it's coming from the data, but it's going all the way through the entire process. And uh, sometimes it might be interesting at least that people know uh, at this step I already made so much a, a large error. I don't have to to, to be over accurate later on, for example. Um, Perception, well, there's an entire discipline that, uh, that is concerned with perceptual studies, uh, uh, but um, I think that this is uh, still open. In that sense, uh, uh, how can visualization be uh, quantitative? Some, some people are saying it cannot be quantitative. You're just showing uh, images, and people are a lot complaining about the color scales. Uh, the, the experts, they're saying the rainbow color scale is really bad and other color scale would be better. But it seems that most people don't see anything in any scale. Any <laughs> uh, maybe this is too, uh, too harsh a harsher statement. But uh, in many cases, uh, with visualization, you would like to see patterns. You would like to see pre-attentively certain phenomena. But uh, uh, it is not, uh, to a certain degree, it's not quantitative. So I mean, if you are if you are color coding um, um, density value, nobody will be able to say this is 190 and, and or 191. And but but for certain for 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 certain qualitative statements, it's uh, it's really great. I mean, but there and 
Uh, I think there will be also a lot of work uh, concerning this uh, uncertainty and how, how to do it. Okay, well, thanks again. Okay, that was the last seminar for this year. Thanks for coming, everyone. And we will meet in the second week of January on the 9th for the seminar. So, so next we'll talk will be given by uh, somebody from Microsoft Research. That will be a remote talk. And the date is not fixed yet, but it will be in January. Hmm. End of January, after the secret date. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.